Hello and welcome. Good morning to everybody in uh, in Europe and uh, afternoon to those uh, further afield uh, in, in Asia to this webinar, uh, How Marketers Can Drive Differentiation in a Commoditized Telco World. Um, so I will just briefly run through the, the speakers we've got on today. So I'm, uh, my name's Chris Barraclough. I'm a partner at STL Partners, and uh, I'll be moderating the session today. And then we have two guest presenters, uh, Laurie Morgan from uh, Oxford SM. Laurie's a commercial marketer who began her career at uh, P&G before moving on to Pepsi, and she sat on the UK board of directors for Pete's Hut, uh, Costa Coffee, and McDonald's. She's a partner at Oxford SM, which is a specialist marketing consultancy that works with clients across many industries, providing advice and support in strategic marketing, innovation and growth, and the development of marketing and sales capabilities. And then we also have uh, Lars Sandstrom and Anna Maria Kastet from uh, yeah, Marketing and Communications at Ericsson Digital Services. They've been involved in sales marketing and business development for many years, and most recently their focus has been uh, tangible short-term campaigns that their telecoms operated clients can run to bring about top line growth. So the, the agenda for today, I'll just briefly run through um, housekeeping. So how the system works, you are all currently on listen only mode and will be for the duration of the, uh, the webinar. I'll then sort of frame the problem in a, what uh, the issue facing the telecoms industry around commoditization before handing over to Laurie, who will look at lessons uh, from uh, Microsoft Xbox and Lloyds Bank in the UK on uh, segmentation and personalization of marketing offers. And then hand over to Anna Maria and Lars, who will look at uh, eSIM and the opportunities to leverage some of the lessons from other industries in the telco itself and drive top line growth. And then we'll have uh, Q&A at, at the end of the session. So go to webinar. Um, you're, as I say, you're in listen-only mode. Um, if you need us, feel free to put something into the comment bar at the um, uh, on the right-hand side, um, the, and also um, do ask questions during the course of the um, uh, of the webinar. You can see the questions uh, tab there as well. Just click on the little button; it'll open up uh, a window for you to ask questions. Um, we'll send you the slides and a recording will be uh, available shortly afterwards, which you can listen to uh, again or share with colleagues. Um, and if you want to tweet us, then uh, ask it as your partners our handle on Twitter. So let me kick off by sort of framing the issue that we, uh, we face in telecom. If we think of uh, commodity markets, uh, they are typically characterized by a high degree of price pressure. And what we can see here is uh, the blue top line is the average figure for telcos with the highest ARPU level across 10 of the largest economies in Europe. You can see the economies we're talking about, the countries we're talking about at the bottom. And the orange line is the average figures for the telcos with the lowest ARPU in each of those markets. And I think the first thing you see for both those lines is we are seeing, as you would expect in a market that is becoming increasingly com commoditized, a high degree of price pressure. People are, uh, companies are unable or finding it more difficult to compete on, uh, on value, on product differentiation, and increasingly competing on price. I think what's also interesting here is the convergence with the line. The highest ARPU figures you know, back in 2005 had a, a price premium of about 35% over the lowest ARPU operator and that has narrowed down to somewhere in the region of 20 to 25 percent more recently so we are seeing a convergence of pricing and of ARPU levels across the different operators which is what you would expect in a market where it is difficult to differentiate uh, on, on on product or, or service I think the other thing that you'd expect to see in a commodity market is um, a convergence of, of market shares as operators or players in a market uh, find it difficult to, to differentiate and they are all offering a very similar product or service. 
And if we look at what's happening in telecoms, this chart shows the average gap between the highest market share player and the lowest market share in Europe's 10 largest economies again. And if we go back to 2005, the late entrants that came to the market uh, in, in, in each of these free, for example, that, that arrived in the marketplace uh, in the early to mid 2000s, um, had a market share gap or were lower than the, the market leader by about 30%. And what we've seen over the, the last 12 or 13 years is that despite the fact that the highest ARPU players, which are typically the market leader, have lowered their price relative to uh, the, the lowest ARPU player, they have still lost share. So the late entrance price-led offers halved the gap with the market leader. And now the differential between the highest and lowest players is down to around 15, 16%. So we are seeing a convergence in market share and a convergence in pricing. So what does this all mean? Well, if we step back to sort of a global view of, of telecoms, we can see that um, operators are investing very large amounts of, of capital in the business. It's always been a very capital intensive industry. And back in 2007, around 217, $220 billion of CapEx was invested across fixed and mobile telecoms. That had grown to 360 billion by 2017. And I think most importantly, it had grown as a percentage of revenue from 17% up to 20%. In other words, operators are, requiring, are required to invest more and more capital to generate each dollar of revenue. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem if they were increasingly profitable. So in fact, uh, those dollars being generated from the capital investment was more profitable. But what we've seen conversely on the right-hand chart is that global telecoms EBITDA margins, so earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization, has dropped from 37% to 35%. Now, you might say, well, that's actually a relatively small amount. But if you take off interest payments, you take off tax payments, depreciation and amortization, the, the earnings level is down to about 5 6 or 7%. So a, a small reduction in EBITDA margin has a big implication for, for net profit. So operators are getting squeezed as well as finding it more challenging to generate each dollar of revenue. And the net effect of that is that we are seeing debt levels rising in the industry as operators are using debt increasingly to fund at least some of their capital uh, expenditure. And this chart shows that the net debt levels of global, the global telecoms industry as a multiple of EBITDA essentially says if an operator or the telecoms industry chose not to pay interest or tax or invest in capital on an ongoing basis in its business, how long would it take to pay back what it owes to the banking community? And in 2007, it would take about 1.4 years to pay back the debt that it owes the banking industry. And that had risen over the 4G cycle to about 2.3 years. So we are seeing debt, and particularly in the last three or four years, rising as operators are finding that funding CapEx purely from operating cash flows is becoming more, more challenging. So I think just to sort of summarize, the, the five factors that we see, and we kind of have, have tried to be fact-based here, that demonstrate that the telecoms industry particularly in Europe, but actually globally, is becoming increasingly com commoditized, is first of all, we are seeing in every market, prices being squeezed. Operators are competing more on price than they are on services and, and differentiated offerings. And differentiation between the operators is diminishing, both in terms of uh, network differentiation, as leaders find that their ability to differentiate by moving to 4G or to 5G is rapidly uh, uh, caught up by, uh, by the fast followers. And also that differentiation in terms of price levels is, is decreasing. As I mentioned, market shares are converging as we're starting to get more players of similar size competing hard. And if you remember Porter's Five Forces, that tends to produce a very um, aggressive and competitive marketplace. And as I've demonstrated, and I think in Europe in particular, 
um, you're, you're starting to see this, margins are coming under pressure. And as a result of that, we are starting to see in, in nearly all markets, particularly in the European markets, debt levels are rising and operators are under some pressure to reduce debt. And Telefonica is one example recently of an operator that has sold off some of its non-core uh, assets in Ireland and Czech Republic to reduce the stress on its balance sheet. So I've sort of painted a, a picture of uh, a commoditized telco world trying to frame the issue, I suppose. And we're just gonna get your response to that with a quick poll as to the degree to which you agree with that picture that I've painted before I then hand over to Laurie, who's going to address perhaps what could be done about it by drawing on some, uh, some examples from other markets. So we should be presenting a poll to you now. And hopefully that's appearing and clear on your, your, your screen. So how well does this picture that I painted of the telecoms industry fit with your experiences in your market? So from not at all right the way through to totally, and we're interested to get your perspective on that. We'll give you a, a couple more seconds to vote before we display that to you. Any more for any more? Okay, shall we? Should we show the results for that? A couple of seconds. Okay, is that possible to? Okay, so uh, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you don't believe I've got it completely wrong. So uh, there are some of you saying somewhat, but the vast majority, it looks like uh, over 90% are saying either a lot or totally, this is the world you are facing. Well, that's good. I, and we have a lot of marketers on here and your job, of course, um, from the CMO down, is to provide at least some of the, um, the, the differentiation in the market that will enable you to provide offers and price differently and hopefully um, uh, develop a more profitable and growing business going forward. So let me hand over to Laurie, who will now take you through some examples from a couple of other industries and how they have addressed this issue. agree with the poll <laughs> most of you somewhat and totally agree because it's a difficult situation therefore that you find yourself in where the market is increasingly feeling commoditized the good news is that a great commercial business person or marketer can take that as a massive opportunity to create value and drive growth and this is a, a category and industry that is really ready for it. So let's take a look at how we can achieve growth, valuable growth, and do it simply. Why me? Um, I, I guess I was asked because this is something that I love to do. I have a real passion for growing brands and for some reason often find myself in difficult situations and needing to do it. Uh, originally, personally, before I was a consultant, in my last role, for example, at McDonald's as the VP of Marketing on the Board of Directors for the UK, my very first day on the job was the day that Super Size Me came out and sales dipped in double digits as a percentage decline because customers, not because they didn't love the taste of the Big Mac, they still did, but they didn't value it and it didn't fit into their lives. So we're going to take a look at how to break out of a commoditized market by really adding, adding value for very specific groups of customers by adding value to their lives. And this is what we do at Oxford. So as when I'm consulting and not client side, we work with teams, and I see many on the, on the call, you're working with teams that either work into you or work across from you. And when the teams are thriving, they can make customers happier and that's what delivers profitable growth. So we're gonna look at the happy customer side of things today. We're gonna look at two different case studies. One on Xbox, which is a little bit more contemporary, a bit more in the digital world, and one on Lloyds Bank, which is a massive uh, UK institution. It's a banking group of 13 banking brands, and very, very traditional and conservative, but both are driving success by adding value in the same way. So let's take a look at Xbox first. Um, and as we do so, in fact, as we go through both case studies, we're going to look at adding value for the customer and adding value for yourselves or for the brand or business you work for. 
adding value for the customer always starts with the who. And the tighter and more specific the who, the better. Once you really understand them, what you're looking for is what do they value? And often we're looking for insight, which is a bit of an ethereal conceptual <laughs> word that people struggle with. But if you focus in on trying to get insightful and a deep understanding into what they value, not what you can offer, not what you are offering, then you can take a look at how you can help them and how only you can help them staying super true to your brand. When you do that well, the right side of the page should follow. And there are really only three ways to drive value for your brand. More people, spending more money with you, or coming more often with more visits. The fourth, the light blue box on more uniquely, is a real long-term proposition for value where they start to love your brand and advocate your brand and stay true to your brand, which effectively gets you more often, more spend, <laughs> more visits. And that is the only way to drive value. So let's start with Xbox and take a look at what they did. Um, and for them, they particularly drove value through personalization for a very specific type of gamer. Let's take a look. We're going to start with the who. For both case studies, we'll go through who you're targeting, what they value, and then how only you can help. So for Xbox, the who they're targeting are gamers, probably, of course, but not just any gamers, a very specific type of gamer, the ones that have their headphones on, they're talking to other people, very, very social while they're gaming. They love to explore new games. They're always trying new things. The way Xbox got to understand them is they have some internal service usage data. They've got behavior data through the Xbox itself. They know what people are playing and they know who those people are. But they also went out and they spoke to 2,000 Xbox owners and started to get to understand them better. So then they had to understand what they value, because like many businesses, they have a ton of data, actually. The real skill is sifting through that data to think about what these people value. So the fact that they value socializing gave them a huge hint. These are people that love to talk to other gamers. They're not sitting there gaming on their own. They're gaming often and they're not gaming by themselves. They also love exploring. So they're always out there looking for the latest games, which means they need to learn to play those new games and they want to be good at them. Which brings you to what is probably what they value the most. Not only do they value playing the games, they value the social aspect of it, watching other gamers game, gaming with other people, almost as much as gaming themselves. And you can probably tell from my picture, I'm not a gamer. I'm not of that generation particularly, but if you look at Forbes, you'll see that this is a big industry. You're talking about millions of followers, millions of pounds or dollars. This is big. So now that you know what they value, what Xbox could figure out is how only Xbox could help. Now, you might look at this and say, not a genius thing to do, but it was. And obviously, in hindsight, it seems a little bit more obvious, but they launched a subscription service. And at the time, it was very unique. And you're talking about a product that's been around for 20 years, the Xbox, almost 20 years. And they reinvented themselves with a subscription. So it's a monthly fee and it opens up hundreds of games. So obviously this is adding value. It's adding value for Xbox because they're getting more people visiting more often and spending more. Not only are they making money on the consoles, but now they're also making money on the subscription and massive money on in-game purchases. So let's hear from Xbox on what that looks like. If you talk to Phil Spencer, who's the executive VP, he will tell you that they have millions of subscribers at 130 pounds a year. That's a beautiful number. They're also playing more. They're buying more games. They're spending more in the games and they're using it more. So when we talk about more users, more spend, more visits, they're getting all of that. And it's creating a love for the brand. So how did they do this? Because, you know, everybody wants to add value, wants to get insightful into what people value. What Xbox does particularly well is number one, they mix machine learning with a human touch. So lots of data out there. You probably have quite a bit of data at your fingertips, but the art is having the human ability to make sense of it, to particularly understand for a particular who or a particular group, what they value. The other thing they did is they, you know, they're, they understand where they are not as strong. So they partnered with Oath, who really understands gamers. So as soon as they figured out this target audience really likes to learn and watch from other gamers, they turned to Oath, who understands this dynamic and this audience. By the way, they still partner with OMD, 
who is a more traditional e agency. So it's not that they're walking away from the good old traditional proven approach. Both introduced them to gamers like LEA, Sniper, and Jelly. Just rolls off my tongue because I'm so hip on these things. And what they did with them is something Xbox couldn't do alone. They matched Xbox with Doritos, with Pepsi, um, who was on a bold campaign at the time. And they took Allie, for example, and used him to launch one of their new products, which was Forza, a racing game. And they created the game for real. They sent him to a Grand Prix racetrack in Germany, and he actually reenacted the game to prove what, what a bold gamer he was. And using Xbox X button, you can flip to watch what he was doing in real life back to your game, back and forth. So really integrated it to create a, a unique personalized campaign, but also a unique and personalized experience. The other thing that Xbox did, and this is a really good lesson, is to be agile. And what that means is don't worry about getting it absolutely perfectly right first time. Get it out there and then listen to your who, listen to your target audience, see how they're behaving, listen to what they're saying about you and optimize while you're live. So what they noticed was that a lot of their users were jumping onto Twitch. And so they jumped on it too. Basically, Twitch is a streaming platform, a streaming service, but it's very, very social. So it's almost YouTube for gamers. You can post, you can chat, you can follow other gamers. There's chat rooms. And when they saw that their users were on there, they, they partnered with Twitch. So for example, with Xbox Connect, you can just yell out Twitch because it's voice activated and your screen will swap into Twitch and uh, show you what's happening. So again, a very unique and personalized campaign and experience. So some of you might be thinking, yeah, but that's Xbox, it's cool, it's very now, it's very digital. What about in a more traditionalized commoditized market? I don't think anything could be tougher than banking. Um, and Lloyd's is being attacked at all sides. So let's have a look at how they also add value through personalization. I'm going to take you through three little examples because what's beautiful about Lloyd's is that they do it time and again, which really proves to any of their users and particularly their loyalists, that they get it. They really understand their who and who they're targeting and how to add value. Number one, parents of adult children who are still living at home. Number two, cancer sufferers who are truly suffering and yet also on top of health issues have financial worries. And three, those people who just are a little bit shy and don't wanna have that money conversation. So the M word, they don't like to talk about money. Obviously, Lloyd's has a ton of data on their hands. They're very protective of their data, understandably. It's regulated, but they, they know a lot about their users and their customers. What was amazing about Lloyd's is they could then get insightful through that data about what they value, again, using that human touch. So for parents of adult kids, it's not just that those young adults need to get out and get their own home. It's that the parents value having space to themselves. They want that empty nest. It's time. They want their kids out. The cancer sufferers, it's not just that they have financial worries. It's that they really have a lot on their minds with their health. They want to focus on their health. And they don't really know how to play the system. They don't know what it's going to cost. It is very mysterious and very anxiety producing on top of their health issues. The financial side is very difficult. Those who are money shy, it's not just that they value talking about money. In fact, they don't really want to talk about it. What they value is their relationship. And to be able to have an ongoing healthy relationship forces you to talk about money in the right way. That's what they value. So what did Lloyd's do? Number one, they helped the parents get the kids out of the house. And they did it in a way where parents could put their own money into the bank and it can be used almost like an offset to a mortgage, but it was totally safe and protected. And they got it back at the end of a few years with interest. Cancer sufferers, this is beautiful. What Lloyd's did is they, they trained people to be financial experts and, and cancer supportive experts by working with Macmillan Cancer Support. So what they understood is that if you can get one person who can talk money, but also can understand the financial implications of cancer, now you're offering something that that target user could really, really value and really needs and can't get anywhere else. And for the money shy, again, Lloyd's partnered with Relate. Relate are relationship experts, the best relationship experts in the UK. So again, what you're combining is in one individual, the ability to understand financial needs, but also the ability to understand relationships. And it's that fantastic combination that money shy people really value. 
And as a result, the right-hand right hand side of value comes more easily. How do you create value for the brand? More people. Why would a cancer sufferer go anywhere else? Why would someone who has relationship concerns go anywhere else to, to do their banking? You get more people. They're also spending more because you're offering them more services. You get the opportunity to upsell and to talk to them and to service them, and they'll come more often. And this is truly uniquely Lloyd's Bank. So the hardest question, how? We looked at how Xbox did this. How is this done? And the reason we're looking at this, obviously, is, is to think about how you could change your behaviors to do things differently. You might think they had some brilliant ex, uh, um, segmentation data to get to their who. But here, I can show on the left-hand side, is a fresco segmentation. It's off-the-shelf standard. Most banks use it. Frankly, nothing special. It's good. But what made it great was taking the segmentation, really understanding that who, picking a very specific who, like parents who are trying to get their kids out of the house, and understanding what they value. And the way they did that was by all working together. And Lloyd's has 13 different brands. Each one has a website, like the, the image in the middle, that is all about the customer's perspective, what they say, how they feel, most importantly, getting into their feelings, and how they behave. So you might get a day in the life video as well. Then on the right-hand side of the slide is an, introduction or an introductory slide to an event that Lloyd's ran, and it's one of many things that they do. They're constantly working on thinking customer. This was done in three locations. I ran it, hundreds of people in each location. So we trained hundreds of people in one day on how to think customer. And we use Domino's as a case study live. So they're always working on this. The last thing about Lloyd's on their how is that for them, this is a multi-dimensional effort to really put the customer at heart. Lots of companies try to do it, but don't do it well. And there are multiple dimensions to getting it right. So in the very heart of this model, it's an Oxford model, you can see that the customer had to be baked into their business objectives and strategies. And it is, it is truly, they are truly committed to it and they believe it will grow their business. Then if you go top, into, top right into the gray area with direction, you can see that the leaders think customer first. They ask the right questions and they care about customer measures. They reorganized. There was a huge reorganization a few years ago, making sure that the customer and the insight was there, that there were data, uh, that they were transforming digitally, so that they were data and digitally oriented for the consumer, and even incubating consumer-centric ideas in a completely different building with a different team. Of course, they were upskilling, as I already said on the previous slide, they're constantly putting the customer into the heart of their training. They put their money and their resources and time behind this with journey mapping and such. And finally, and most importantly, people at Lloyd's will tell you, this is just how we work around here. And that's when you know you've truly converted a business to put the, the customer at the heart of driving value. So that's Xbox, and that's a little bit of insight into Lloyd's and how they put the customer at the heart to really drive value. Uh, we're gonna run a little poll just to see which of the four lessons are most relevant to you. Obviously, we think all four are relevant, so it's more of a question of which one's most relevant to you. So the first lesson is about the who. Really a lesson on thinking customer and getting to know what they value. The second one is about combining machine learning and AI with that human touch. The third one is about leveraging channels to successfully target your proposition. And then the final one is really getting to solutions, marketing better segmented solutions to your customers. So let's see. So you can put your votes in. It'll be interesting to see if across those of you listening, there is a an area that is standing out more than the others. And there absolutely is. So we're getting votes across the board, but you can see where the passion points are. With a passion for A and D. So really, for me, it's, all, it's all, almost A, actually. It's almost the timeless one, which is really getting to the heart of your customer thinking about who they are. And whilst we would like to target as many as possible sometimes, because you think that's what drives growth, the more specific you can be, the better to really think customer and what they value. And then the other key area is really getting to solutions. 
giving them more than a product, giving them more than a service, really something that adds value to them and their lives, which means really understanding them and their lives. Terrific. So we're going to close the poll. And that brings us to the end of my section. So I'm going to hand back to Chris, but looking forward to questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Laurie. That, that was great. And I found it particularly interesting, the notion of um, becoming better solution marketers versus brand marketing. And I, I think of telco and the real strength of telco marketing historically has been about pushing the big brand rather than pushing particular products or services at uh, sort of segments, which I suppose kind of plays to uh, a uh, thinking about the customer more, more carefully and coming up with solutions that are appropriate to them. Um, that's great. We're now going to move on to um, the to Anna Maria and, and Lars. I would remind everybody: um, if you've got questions, do put them into the question panel, and we'll endeavour to answer them today. If we can't, we will certainly be writing up and a response to them, and including that with the presentation pack we put out. So do do feel free to ask questions um, whenever you wish. And um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Lars and Anna Maria, who will talk about the implications of all this for the telecoms industry. Thank you, Chris. And Laurie, thank you for those inspiring cases. Uh, these are really good examples on how we can also think about uh, creating more value in telecoms. So Lasse and I will today uh, share some ideas on how you as a telecom service provider can and grow your top line. And what we will focus on are some use cases that we believe can be implemented already in, within three months. The topic and opportunity we're focusing on today is the eSIM for consumer devices. And here, when we talk about consumer devices, we really mean the smartphones and wearables. Yeah, and we, we started working with new use cases and business models that uh, could be enabled with eSIM like um, six months ago. Uh, today, most companies look on eSIM to cost cost, but, but we believe the big thing here is, is to be creative and proactive for service providers uh, in order to drive the top line. The market, eSIM for smartphones, started this fall with launches of the products that you all know about from Apple and Samsung. And by 2025, GSMA estimates that more than 2 billion eSIM devices will be shipped. So this is a market coming. So with that, what use cases have we worked on? Yeah, so the six use cases coming up soon uh, that we believe eSIM can enable many opportunities around are the ones that you can see in the slide here. Uh, they are grouped into two categories. We have four green ones, uh, which are extensions of current offerings and are using very uh, traditional business models, as we know, in telecoms. Then the second category, uh, representing the two uh, blue ones here, are new services. And these are more uh, based on a two-sided business model. And Laurie, you said earlier that the key to generate real value with targeted offering uh, is to start to understand who your target group is, and then what do this group value? And the way that we have approached this for the eSIM opportunity uh, was to conduct a study uh, where we turned to our consumer research department that we call Consumer Lab. And for those of you who are, who are not so familiar with Consumer Lab, uh, they have, uh, for over 20 years uh, of experience, studying people's behavior uh, and value, including the way that they act and think about the different ICT services and products. And this study was made <clears throat> of smartphones users in five different countries, and the, the representative was 200 uh, million smartphone users. And, and what was interesting here is that usually Consumer Lab gives us a lot of quantitative data, but here we got a lot of qualitative data because we, we saw that the main benefit was actually the written comments that was given by the consumers. And, and it's very inspiring when you get a lot of written comments. And these comments made us redefining the use cases. And I, I like to give a 
start off by kicking off this by giving an example. And this is the use case Excel in connectivity, as you see to the left. We thought uh, that the main interest here would be able to change service provider based on who has the best coverage or lowest tariff, et cetera, at different times of day or different spots. But the key thing is what the, will, the consumers were willing to pay for was a service we can call peace of mind. When out of coverage, having a critical situation and you need to get in contact with someone, situations like your car breakdown in the middle of nowhere, you lost your key, you need to get hold of your child and so on. We got unprompted answers from 45% in the study, unprompted answers. Uh, saying that they were willing to pay like uh, an insurance fee per month in order to be able to get connectivity. Again, to an extra cost per event. But now think of this proposition, an insurance service for say two euro per month for being able to activate extra connectivity when needed. These two euros uh, has a very low cost, so they basically go down all the way to bottom line directly. And the fact that 75% in the study said that they would activate the reasonable price plan on top of the existing one is very promising. Yeah, Lasse, that's a great add-on to the existing ARPU. So we think that Excel in connectivity is a clear winner, but this is not the only one. So let's have a look at the next case we call travel specials. Uh, if you look at roaming outside EU today, we have around 50% of what we call silent roamers. Silent roamers are consumers that are not using roaming because they fear a bill shock. The fear results then that they only use mobile data in Wi-Fi hotspots. Now, 50% silent roamers, that's a lot of lost revenues, right? Then the question is, what can eSIM bring to uh, satisfy the need of cost control for these consumers when they are traveling? So we developed some different uh, business model suggestions that we tested, one being an offer based on a double-sided business model with, for example, travel agencies or our companies. Another offering being a local plus tariff subscription that you can be billed by your home uh, service provider. So those are examples. What we also uh, discovered in the study that the category of travelers, uh, and we had different categories uh, that we looked at, but the category of travelers that show the highest interest in these services, also the highest willingness to pay, and those were around 70% of all the respondents, uh, they are uh, today buying a local SIM card. So this is, uh, a way of addressing the uh, the challenge that we earlier discussed, but also to get the extra revenues. So as you can understand then this is a very high interest and willingness to pay when we look at our different services. We should also mention that uh, already now you can have a multiple eSIM in your smartphone, but only one can be active. Yeah, and I think by now we should, should take another use case which surprised us, and we love surprises. <laughs> And this, this was the connected consumer devices. Now, here we thought smartwatches was the top priority, but smartwatches were only number four. Number one, that is the most wanted one, was actually the laptop. Today, most of us connect the laptop via tethering or public hotspots when out and about. Tethering works fine, but it drains your battery, and when you are out and about, you do not want to drain the battery of your lifeline. So the other portion here was the Wi-Fi hotspots. They're also becoming a concern, primarily for enterprise users, because of security aspects. And here, cellular connection was preferred. So look now on, on how we add the numbers. Take a laptop add-on subscription for, say, two euros per month. Smart watches today are around three to eight euro add-ons in most markets. Add that peace of mind subscription for another two euro per month. We are about to change the slope of the ARPA curve Chris showed in the beginning of this webinar. Yes, and there is more. Uh, the last green one of the use cases is what we call the try and buy. So let's have a look at it. 
For some time, Lars and I have been working with add-on services. Uh, these are services that consumers can add on to the existing bundle. Now, in order to get services launched and uh, increase the service adoption, we have seen that it's the su su successful way to offer a limited, is to offer a limited trial period. Uh, in the study, we got the response that 54% of the smartphone users would pick an operator that offers the try and buy plan, as you can see in the slide. The rest of uh, the slide where you can see uh, the different uh, uh, services that we were asking the respondents to uh, uh, give their show their interest in. And as you can see, some of them uh, and the actual uh, favorite was the connectivity boost type one. So, for example, connectivity in uh, boosted in crowded places, for example. But there are also other uh, add-on services that you can try, like a, a phone as your key or different family subscription plans. Then you might have the question now, do you really need an eSIM to offer these services? So if the try and buy is from your existing service provider, then you don't need it. But if the, the service uh, is from another provider, then you need to download a new eSIM. So this is also an opportunity to address uh, new customers. Now, we have two more use cases left to share. Uh, and the next one, Lasse, that's your favorite one. Yes, <laughs> the marketing campaigns, I love that one. Now, if you look on uh, this one, which is then a, a double-sided business model, it's, it's, we took a look for on consumer goods companies and, and the question they have is, of course, like Laurie said, how to better target individuals and ultimately how to increase conversion rate. So we asked ourselves, is there a role for easing in here? Uh, now, there's no magic here. To excel in conversion rate, you need to have a targeted proper proposition and interactivity. So, so how do we get that? Uh, we took an example and we talked with uh, some um, companies in the apparel industry. And looking on their behavior today and, and look what they could do in the future. So on banners, ads, and that right in the future, you could offer your customer to become a VIP, try out our new collection before it's available in stores, scan this barcode and get three days exclusivity. By scanning the barcode, you download an eSIM that gives the consumer an access to a virtual private network and an augmented reality client as well as being able to do whatever he or she did before. For these three days, the consumer can try out with the augmented reality client the new collection using their smartphone, tablet, or laptop before it's available in stores. You know, they see themselves in the new collection. They can send these video clips to their friends or post on social media to get comments on how the new collection fit them. It's a clear revenue driver for the apparel company in terms of increased sales. Yes, and we hope by now with these examples that you all understand why Lasse and I are so excited and updated by this eSIM opportunity. It's a new wonderful tool, we believe, that resonates with the cons consumers and open up the doors for new revenues. But before we close, finally, I just want to say a couple of words on the last case in the picture, what we call events which is also using a double-sided business model, similar to the marketing campaign Lasse just described. Here, we refer to events as being a sport, uh, could be a sport, could be a concert, could be a trade show. And like in the marketing campaign, uh, we are talking about a short time period. The offering here will be targeted to the consumer that has an interest in an artist, or it could be a soccer game that they want to participate in. The organizer of these events then can uh, <clears throat> use an eSIM to provide additional offers, uh, like a VIP QR code, uh, where the uh, consumer will get with treatment during the event. It could be short, non-released video clips or song clips before uh, <clears throat> the event gets started. So as you can imagine, there are endless opportunities uh, for uh, creating additional great assets and content that consumer will value. 
And then, which you as a service provider then can gain more understanding of your subscribers' behavior and what they would like going forward. A little bit to what Lori also said earlier. That was the last case for today. So I'm handing over to you, Lars, to wrap it up. Thank you. Final words. Here is a summary uh, of uh, what we showed. What is interesting here is the, apart from the high numbers, is that we also saw a very high willingness to pay for the green ones. The blue ones, of course, is a different business model, the double-sided business model. We can also see that we have two groups here. One is in the high 80s and one is in the 50s. Now, even the 50s, that's a very high number when we do consumer lab and look on both the interest together with the willingness to pay. When looking on this chart, the number one question Anna Maria and I get when we talk to a service provider about this is, is where to start. To us, the try and buy use case is ideal because it's something that you as a service provider can start out without any lengthy negotiations with other companies. And this is all about get to business now. Before handing over to you, Chris, we would like to do a small poll again. So apart from the connected devices where the market had already started, which of the following five use cases feels most compelling and relevant for your customers in your market? We have try and buy, marketing campaigns, excellent connectivity, travel specials, and event experiences. I hope the numbers are coming in because I cannot see anything from my screen, but you see that, Chris, right? Yeah, they, they are coming in. Sorry, they are. We'll just pause. We're just waiting for a couple more, and then we can pause. Interesting. Do you want to show that? You can see a little spread there. Hopefully, you, you've got visibility of that now. Yes, we can see. Thank you. So that's interesting, just sort of uh, quite a spread across uh, across at least four of them there with particular excelling connectivity and the try and buy that you mentioned uh, being mm -hmm. popular um, uh, amongst uh, the, the audience. Um, so I think we're now going to move over to um, Q&A. And I guess since we've just talked about eSIM um, and these eSIM offers and this clearly some interest in those and I think you've given a, a sort of teaser, some teaser content. They look the questions. One question I had is you, you mentioned that these can be launched in three months. Um, anything in Telco um, that takes three months to me is, is remarkable. It tends to be um, longer to, to launch um, even price plans, let alone sort of propositions like this. Can it really be done as quickly as that? Uh, yes, and the reason is it's uh, uh, going to be sold predominantly as, an, as a service offering. Uh, and the reason is that there's a lot of um, security and confidentiality around GSMA, uh, around ESIM. And GSMA, they have usually a certification process of some 9 to 12 months uh, to start off. So if you want to start and have your own eSIM as, a, as an operator, you would need to go through the whole GSMA certification, uh, build this uh, concrete uh, site with the biometric pass and, and things like that. It's, it's very complicated. Uh, so uh, most of them uh, that I've talked to is also thinking of as, an, uh, as a service offering. There might, of course, be countries which requires this to be done locally. Uh, India is an example of that, and I would guess uh, China would be another example, but, and there are more than that. But uh, otherwise, it's an as-a-service offering, and then it goes very quickly. And, and practically, what are the steps that you would undertake if you take an example of one of these as an operator? What would you actually do to launch a service like this? Uh, I think the key thing here is, is uh, not at all the, the, um, uh, the technology. The key thing is the creativeness in, in terms of marketing. 
the other thing is that uh, you also need, um, there's another piece of equipment here called the entitlement server. And, and this is, of course, something you, I would advise you not to, to develop yourself, but to buy it as an operator because you, every, every uh, smartphone and, and smartwatch manufacturer have their own profile. And even if you say Apple, Apple has not just one profile, they have one profile per device. So you constantly need to have very, very good relations with the innovation teams, with the uh, vendors of, of the devices. So um, uh, I think that, that the technology is, is going to be very easy. You will find that uh, uh, no problem, no showstopper. The showstopper here is going to be the way you negotiated with your partners in order to do, for instance, a, a marketing campaign. Or if you're going to do Excel in connectivity, you need to uh, have an agreement with the other operators in, in, uh, in your country. Because on that, the two euros a month extra connectivity is effectively the ESIM roaming onto another operator that has a better coverage in that area. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that, that means that you would, for, for a, a short period of time when you need this, uh, you would actually activate, uh, activate the connection with the other operator, but still be built by a home operator. Okay, no, that makes sense. Uh, you mentioned partnerships just then, Lars, and, 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 and Laurie talked a, a lot about partnerships from uh, Xbox, um, partnering mm -hmm. quite interestingly with, with uh, Ali A and Jelly and Sniper, and then Lloyd Bank partnering with, with Relate, for example, or with Macmillan for mm -hmm. cancer sufferers. And I look at the partnerships that Telco is going to take, and they tend to be the big partnerships with Netflix or Spotify. And I guess, Laurie, what lessons do you think there are here for, for operating in terms of the way they think about going to market with partners, in terms of what, you know, what we can draw from, from Xbox and, and Lloyd? That's a really good question because it's, it's fascinating to see such amazing partnerships in this category, but not very much being done with them insightfully. So what you see from, from Xbox and from Lloyd's is they don't just bolt their partnership onto their offering, they seamlessly integrate the two to find a special new space and it's all around what the consumer values. So Spotify or Netflix, great example, and by the way, those are two companies that have masses of insight, masses of data and human insight into what customers value. And I'll see uh, one of the clients that I work with in telco does work with Spotify and yet doesn't really bring it to life for a specific group of customers. So the question is, you know, when we, how does music fit into our lives? Who are you mm -hmm. targeting and what do they value about music on the go or music that's recommended specifically for them? or music through their laptop, music through their phone, through an Uber, really trying to get that the two technologies to merge to come up with something special and unique. And as a, as a quick other example, at McDonald's, when we worked with Coke, there was no better partnership probably in the world than those two. And it isn't mm -hmm. simply that you offer Coke with your Big Mac. It's coming up with absolutely integrated programs that nobody else could do like music programs and concerts, or even the Coke glass that you can only buy with a Big Mac. So really figuring out how you can truly add value for your customers through that partnership and leveraging what your partners have beyond just the product or service that they sell, that intelligence that they have, the, the capabilities that they have you can build on. I mean, I think it's really I, interesting. I, in, te in telecoms, it tends to be, I will bolt on a... Yeah content partnership, Netflix or Spotify, to a package, to a, my higher spending data package or something. Lars, sorry, you were going to, you were going to say. Yeah, I, I said, I was going to say that, that um, I, you know, I, I know for sure now the attendees not joining this webinar because some of the uh, service providers we have talked about are sponsors of um, soccer teams. <laughs> and for yeah. them, yeah, and for them, uh, they have all rated the event experiences number one because when they have a close connection to a certain football team, uh, that is where they want to start. So, so you know, you see there's a bunch of different ones that go from different angles. And, and there, there are other companies that have um, a foot also in the, uh, 
uh, wrong, um, not warehouses, but what, what, what you call it, uh, shopping malls and, and the like. And they value this whole thing with the campaigns and focus on a shopping mall to get this extra benefit. So, so that is my clear advice also to you as a service provider, that you need to build from where your shareholders and where your existing partnerships are today in order to get going quickly. Good advice. Thank you. I'm conscious of time. So one last question. We've talked a lot during this about data, the importance of data and being able to extract insight from that data to then offer differentiated offers. Banks, obviously, we know have a lot of data. Telcos have a huge amount of data. They have know your customer data. They have click stream data. They have, uh, they don't have access to all this data, but they have a lot of information about location and so on. Is the issue that we have as an industry in terms of developing personalized differentiated offers, one that is that we are failing to extract insight from that data, or is it that we are failing effectively to translate that insight into innovative, compelling offers? It's a kind of open question. Where is the breakdown occurring? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? It's a bit unfair on you, Laurie. I know you're not a telco okay. specialist, but uh, yeah. great if, you, if you've got thoughts on it. No, I do, and I think I think it's both of those things. I think for the for the for the first part, when you take your data, it doesn't mean much unless you can drive it into insight and value, and that comes from looking beyond the data to try to understand how are people behaving, and importantly, how are they feeling. And I think we don't ask that enough. How are people feeling and what's going on in their lives? So you might have data around your own specific uh, service or solution or product that you're looking at, but you're not really thinking beyond into how it really fits into their lives. The second part of it is, and I think in telco specifically, often what happens is we have an idea first. Because it's so technological and the technology changes and grows so quickly that something gets developed. And we then try and retrofit it back into people's lives and figure out how it's meaningful. What is fabulous, if you can get ahead of the curve, is start with the consumer and the customer. Think about them, their lives, how their lives are changing, and create solutions for them. Um, and that's a real change. And organizations aren't already equipped to deal with that mm. way of thinking because they're almost backwards because it's been so successful in the past. That's really interesting. Lars, anything to add to that? Br briefly, I'm conscious of time. Yeah, I can, I can say that most of our, most of the service providers we meet, they talk about uh, uh, using analytics and so on in order to um, look on how the network performs uh, and, and where people are calling. They're more con con concerned about the quality they give to the users than actually deriving what users are doing. And when you talk about that, they are all all very, very clear about uh, the confidentiality. They don't want to look on individuals and so on. But what we advocate, me and Anna Marie, is that you, you use a very good uh, segmentation model. And you have eight, nine different segments based on value and attitudes. And there you can collect the data and there you can drive your business. But uh, telecom is, is not there yet. Great, thank you. And I think um, that's a nice way of, of, of wrapping up. Um, if, um, so thank you uh, very much to both of our uh, guest speakers today. Um, I hope you found the audience found that an interesting, uh, I know there was quite a lot covered. I'm sure you'll have questions um, of, of us. Um, do please get in contact, there are contact details on the screen now. We will follow up with um, all of the um, presentations and the results of the polls as well for you. Um, and as you exit, you, there will be a feedback poll. Please do take a moment to, um, to answer that if you can. It does provide us with very useful feedback on how to improve these webinars for you. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you shortly when we run the next webinar. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.